All right, as uh, we get ready to kick off this webinar, we'll give it another minute for more uh, attendees to join, and then we'll get started. All right, let's get started. Welcome to today's webinar, A Joint Effort, Managing the Road to Recovery in Knee Injuries. This webinar is hosted by Medical and Life Care Consulting Services, case management and nurse consulting firm headquartered in Massachusetts in collaboration with Dr. Sean Rocket of Orthopedics of New England. We're excited that you've joined us for this presentation. My name is Gigi Liggins and I'm the moderator for today's webinar. This webinar is anticipated to run about 50 minutes with an additional 10 minutes provided for questions and answers. Participant audio will be on mute throughout the webinar and we ask that questions are submitted using the question and answer feature within the Zoom webinar dashboard. If you're having any IT issues, please feel free to use the chat feature. Post-webinar, we will share a link to where you can access an on-demand replay, along with a link to a short survey. Again, we're excited to host today's webinar and look forward to an opportunity to partner with you. To kick us off, I'll pass it to our host, Cynthia Borbo. Cynthia Borbo is president and founder of Medical and Life Care Consulting Services and has worked as a Massachusetts registered nurse certified rehabilitation nurse, certified nurse case manager, and certified nurse life care planner for over three decades. Cindy? That sounds awful, over three decades. <laughs> so, welcome today. And um, before I hand this over, I'd like to share a little bit about the Injury Insight Program. Some of you participated in the first webinar that we put on, and this is our second. Uh, it's a four-part webinar series designed to educate claims professionals, HR resource professionals, and case managers on the rehabilitation and recovery process of injuries, illnesses, and diagnoses, both common and uncommon, within workers' compensation. The program allows claims professionals and industry stakeholders to have direct access to medical specialists to help you better understand the diagnoses, the road to recovery, and potential obstacles and answer your toughest questions. So get your questions ready. It's also great to be able, we see as nurses, we see the doctors all the time, but you all don't get to meet them. So uh, this is a great opportunity for you to interact with our physicians. For this session, we're pleased to have physician specialist, Dr. Sean Rocket of Orthopedics of New England. Dr. Sean E. Rocket grew up in the New England area where he attended Harvard University. He played football and baseball and earned a Bachelor of Arts in Biology. He also attended Tufts University School of Medicine, where he earned his medical degree and completed his residency. Dr. Rocket is currently the senior partner at Orthopedics New England, a group of 16 providers offering complete care for all orthopedic conditions. Uh, Dr. Rocket specializes in shoulders and knees and serves as a professor at Tufts University School of Medicine. He has been a coach for Wellesley football, baseball, softball, and soccer youth teams, and is currently the team physician for Natick and Wayland High Schools, Belmont High School, and St. Sebastian School. In addition to his CrossFit participation, Dr. Rocket is the orthopedic advisor to CrossFit and serves as the head orthopedic surgeon to the CrossFit Games. He is passionate about surgeon and a diplomat of the American the Board of Orthopedic Surgeons. Hello. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you now. We lost your audio for a second and I think you were on the last uh, just finalized um, of Dr. Rocket's bio. It's right after passionate. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> After passionate. He's passionate about helping those injured return to work. The most important sentence, return to work, sports, or daily activities without pain. Dr. Rocket is a member of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. American Board of All right, well, Surgeons. Thank you. We lost you one more time, so I'm just going to finish it up. Dr. Rocket is a member of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, a member of the Arthroscopy Association of North America, a diplomat of the American Board of Orthopedic Surgeons. Now we will pass it over to Dr. Rocket. Go ahead and share your screen. How's that? Did you, did you get it? Uh, yes, we see it. Perfect. Oh, yeah. Great. Um, so do we, we're just going to start with the poll. Is that right, Gigi? Yep, that's correct. Excellent. Well, thank, thank you for having me. I've worked with Cindy for, for many years here, and uh, she's, she's been great to work with. And uh, the whole team uh, has been you know, very helpful for, for me. Uh, but just to just to, as I was uh, thinking about this uh, team approach, um, we were, came up with some poll questions and uh, just wanted to get to know sort of who's out there and what what is going on. And so we have a poll here about what is the most important aspect of your life right now? Is it career satisfaction, health, finances, personal relationships, vacation time? or the dreaded muting yourself, or more importantly, forgetting to mute yourself on, on Zoom calls. Uh, so you can go ahead and fill out that poll right now. We'll have other poll questions later on throughout the talk. We'll leave the poll up for about another 15 seconds. So we see that about 50% have voted. Feel free to go ahead and share what's going on in your life right now. All right, in three, two, one. There we are. So we have health and personal relationships are the uh, the top the top fifty uh, fifty right there. So that's uh, it's good to know that you know with health uh, you know it's it's not until you injured that you really sometimes appreciate your health. So uh, you know we'll talk about injuries today and you know we'll be appreciative of of the health that we have. Um, so going, starting on my talk, I, uh, on weekends, this is sort of who I take care of. This is one of the teams that I take care of and uh, I'm a team doctor and, and you can see what a great team you know, there is out there on, on my weekends. And then on weekdays, um, this is the other, the other team I like to take care of. This is the, a, a team of workers. Um, and so, and I, I kind of treat them the same way. If, if an athlete gets hurt, they want to get back uh, as fast as possible. They want to make sure everything is, um, you know, okay for them to return to sports and, and do it uh, in a safe manner. The same thing with work. Uh, I want to make sure that someone is, is safe getting back to work uh, in a speedy, efficient manner, um, you know, without, uh, you know, having to worry about themselves, you know, getting back to work. Uh, so from a team approach point of view, the, the worker who is now a patient, uh, the first thing they experience uh, determines really the success of the outcome of their, their treatment. They're scared, they're nervous, they're angry. Sometimes they're, they need reassurance. They're, they're worried about what just happened to their shoulder or their knee. And I find that having the case manager uh, with us at the visit is, is vital. Uh, you know, if everybody believes that taking care of the patient's the first priority, everything else follows after that. Um, you know, and then the, once the patient sees, you know, that that uh, everybody is giving a coordinated effort to help them and protect them, they sort of there's a buy-in there that they they feel like they are, um, you know, their fear is diminished and they're part of the team. So, uh, you know, basically, I like to just keep it simple. You know. If this is a, a, a short putt, then make it make it easy. Um, you know, there are certain things that we do with uh, with patients, and number one is observe. You know, that's the simplest, easiest observe. See, you know, if if it's something that can be observed, uh, you know, sometimes just time uh, helps and makes things better. 
uh, you know, or is it physical therapy? Is it MRI? Is it injection? Is it, is it surgery? Um, those are really some of you know, the treatment options that we have. Getting a quick workup is important. I think a rapid response to someone's injury is important. Um, you know, and that starts with really getting them in to see, you know, and as I like to say, you know, the specialist, the orthopedic surgeon, room, you know, sometimes in the emergency room, you know, they're, they're good at a lot of things, um, but, you know, I, I feel like we are good at, at, you know, musculoskeletal care. And so getting an accurate diagnosis just from a physical exam is very helpful. Um, and also, again, the team care approach, nurse case managers, adjusters, office staff, uh, all working together. I have a medical scribe where we can get same day notes and calls to the case managers and adjusters uh, as needed. Um, often, you know, I find a light duty uh, is reasonable. If someone is hurt, you know, they, they can drive, they, you know, they might not be able to lift or, or reach or squat or kneel, but they can certainly do do other things, you know, as opposed to an emergency room where they just, you know, give them the out of work note and somebody falls off, uh, you know, into that, that abyss of, you know, being out of work, uh, keeping somebody at work if safe is medically, uh, you know, important, you know, from a mental health point of view and reintegrating back into the community, uh, very important. Um, you know, we've had many cases where people have uh, you know, during, even during COVID where they couldn't go back to work, where, where, you know, we've had, you know, workers who have fallen off into, you know, cases of, uh, you know, uh, sort of depression almost where they, they feel like they're, they're, you know, not doing something productive. So I think keeping somebody engaged, keeping them busy is, is very important. Um, so no surprises. I like sort of laying things out ahead of time. If it's non-surgical, uh, giving somebody a timeline. If it's surgical, giving somebody a timeline of what their activity level, what their pain level, what their expectations uh, are going to be. I will always fill out a, a sheet if it's surgery for commonly asked questions, whether it's driving, sleeping, uh, using a sling, uh, brace or crutches, duration for weight bearing, showering. You know, these people people will get this uh, right at the first you know, visit, preoperative visit even, so they know what to expect ahead of time. Um, when can they return to light duty in a brace or in a sling? When, uh, you know, are, can they be without the sling or the brace? And when can they return to heavy duty? Um, and, you know, communication is really important uh, to know, you know, to have people hear you, listen to you, understand what their expectations, what our expectations are. And then monthly follow-ups typically and keep a close eye on people, make sure they come back every month for close surgical follow-up. Um, so we are talking about the knee today. Uh, and this is sort of uh, the, the intro slide for the knee with the, a lot of things we'll talk about will be related to meniscus, ligaments, uh, the articular cartilage, as you see there, a nice an anatomical picture of the uh, of the knee, and we have our next poll question, which we're going to get into. Gigi, do you have the poll question for us? Here it is. Uh, so, next poll question: What condition poses the most challenges in returning individuals to work? Meniscus tears, Baker's cysts, MCL tears, ACL tears, tendonitis, contusions, bursitis, arthritis, and patellofemoral syndrome. These are some of the things we're going to be talking about today. And, uh, and you know, I, I know which one I would choose. Um, and I would, uh, I would, you know, let you answer your questions and we'll, we'll see. All right, don't be shy. Go ahead and uh, make a guess at the conditions that are, that which condition poses the most challenges in returning to work. We'll keep the poll up. We see only about 28% have voted. So go ahead and take a guess. Um, I'm sure Dr. Rocket will let us know what's correct. Mm -hmm. What's correct, yeah. Because I have most of the answers, not, uh, <laughs> not all. All right. Let's see if we can get a few more people to vote. Okay, closing the poll in three, two, one. Anyway, looks like, yes, number one answer is 
arthritis and patellofemoral syndrome. And that would be my answer as well. It is, uh, it's a very difficult, uh, difficult diagnosis to, uh, to get people to understand and to get them, get them back uh, safely without pain. All right, so going on to, uh, to our talk here. I'm just gonna come back to it. There we go. All right, so first is meniscus tears. Um, this, these pictures are from my uh, website called 321gomd.com. And it's basically just uh, the pictures and diagnoses that and you can, you're welcome to go to it. And it, I like it because it shows the anatomy and it sort of brings me um, uh, into my office is that I'll use it and show the patient, you know, what the, what exactly we're talking about. So most important part of this first, uh, slide is the, uh, blood supply to the meniscus. As you see that cross section, the inner side, the central side doesn't have the blood supply. The outer side has the blood supply. And if you have a tear on the outer side, then that is a repairable tear. Uh, and if it's small enough, it, it's able to be repaired some back versus the inner side, which is not able to heal because of no blood supply. And again, this is one of my favorite slides here on the left, uh, where it shows you know, exactly what different types of tears are. And we can see that on the MRI and I can show people you know, exactly what their, their tear looks like. Uh, and you know, it makes, I, I describe most of the meniscal tears uh, as a, like a hangnail. If you have a hangnail and you trim the hangnail, that sort of takes the pain away. So you see there the slide on the right where you have um, a piece of tissue flipping around into the knee joint and then you go in with the shaver and you smooth out that piece. So that I describe it like that, that hangnail effect where there's pulling on that tissue and there are no nerve endings in the meniscus. It's, it's when you're pulling and the nerve endings are on the capsule. And so that pulls on the capsule and that gives the nerves uh, sensation. And that's what hurts uh, so much. Uh, the other issue is if you have a piece of tissue in the knee like that, then obviously the, the absolute indication for surgery is uh, a locked bucket handle. Or if you have a piece of, of tissue like that in the joint, if it's the knee is stuck or buckling or your leg is giving out, those are absolute indications. The other indications for surgery would be level of pain, tear size, and location. Um, and so, you know, some people can live with very small tears and, and they don't, it doesn't bother them that much. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if you have a, a decent sized tear, then that would be a reason to have surgery. Also, importantly, as we talked about arthritis, uh, the amount of arthritis someone has, the MRIs are very sensitive. And they can pick up a lot of you know little tiny tears. And if someone has severe arthritis with a really tiny little tear, it's most likely the severe arthritis that's causing the the uh, the issue. And you know that has been proven, and that has you know from from my point of view, it's what I've seen with patients. If they really have severe severe arthritis, the arthroscopic results are not going to be great unless there is a piece of tissue that is flipping around inside the joint. So as we talked about the different treatments of trimming versus repair, you see the repair on the peripheral side where you can pass sutures. Um, and you know, obviously the repair is a much bigger recovery from surgery. Um, and uh, and you know, so it's, it's, uh, the difference between a trim and a repair is, is significant. And people have to know that ahead of time if you're thinking about repairing a meniscus. Um, as far as letting people know ahead of time, there is this uh, care pathways, which uh, we have uh, at, at, uh, uh, with Cindy, we uh, have created a care pathways, which she uh, came to us and we went down through all our diagnoses and, and sort of said, where, what is a reasonable time period for someone to return to work? And we've come up with those. And so it makes that office visit a lot easier when you have these steps ahead of time, when someone is gonna return to work. Um, and so, you know, you know, when you're sitting in the office with somebody and you, you say, okay, now let's talk about work. This is sometimes the faces that you get, uh, you get, you know, the Michael Scott, or you have the Zach face looking at you, uh, blankly. Uh, but if they know ahead of time through this type of care pathway, it's, um, 
They'll know at what point are they going to use crutches, at what point are they going to get off of crutches. If it's a simple trim, you know, two two days off crutches, uh, and then you know, hopefully by six to eight weeks returning to regular work. So it takes those blank stare faces away if you have this nice care pathway uh, ahead of time uh, delineated. Baker's cyst. I included Baker's cyst because it's probably the number one most common thing that we get asked about that you actually don't have to do much about. Uh, but people have a very uh, difficult time when they have pain in the back of their knee and someone says they have a Baker's cyst. A lot of people think it's the Baker's cyst that's causing the issue, where as it's either arthritis typically or, um, or it's uh, the meniscal tear causing the pain. Uh, and so we often will get asked, you know, what is a Baker cyst? You know, I need it. I need to get this cyst, get it rid of it. Um, but oftentimes it's, uh, it's a non-issue. Uh, it becomes an issue if it gets big. And if it gets big, then people usually notice a, a loss of motion or some uh, tightness or stiffness with bending the knee when they flex their knee. And what happens with the Baker cyst, as you see here, it's a little hernia through the capsule where fluid from the knee joint escapes into the back of the knee. Uh, and it's, you know, I basically tell them it's like a hernia. It's like a fluid, typically. It can be fluid filled, it can be gel filled. Um, you can um, put a needle into the uh, cyst and aspirate it. You can also uh, uh, inject cortisone. Cortisone has been shown to decrease the fluid and decrease the swelling which will then hopefully also decrease the, the size of the Baker's cyst. Um, if you have uh, arthritis, that's an issue because you can typically keep producing fluid and, and keep getting uh, you know, fluid to escape into the back of the knee. If you don't have a meniscal tear and you don't have arthritis and you have a Baker's cyst and it's limiting you and it's affecting your bending or your squatting, then sometimes, and you've tried aspiration and you've tried cortisone, so all these things, uh, then you could actually go in and excise the cyst. And this has uh, been done. I do this here with a, a little uh, dissection in the back of the knee. Again, it's once you tell somebody, oh, we can take that out and we'll make a little dissection in the back of your knee, they sometimes say it's, it's not so bad or I can live with it. Um, but that is the actual cyst. That's a good size cyst, you know, about a golf ball size right there. Um, and then what you do is you tie off the opening, you tie off the hernia, much like you know regular inguinal hernia surgery. So you prevent fluid from escaping into the back of the knee. Moving on to MCL tears. These this is a nice slide that shows uh, grade one, grade two, grade three MCL tears. MCL tears are usually uh, uh, from an injury, whether it's twisting or whether it's from getting hit on the side of the knee, the outer side of the knee and the inner side of the knee stretches. And you can have grade one, which is really like just a small partial tear of the ligament. Grade two is a bigger tear, but still having some attachment. And grade three is if it's completely torn. Uh, even with a grade three, um, you can have uh, you know, healing and uh, non-surgical treatment, even with a grade three uh, injury. It's rare to operate on MCLs, but if they don't heal, uh, then, and they heal, or they heal with laxity or looseness, and the knee is buckling, then you can reconstruct the MCL. And that is seen here in the, in the slide, where you have the, the ligament reattached with uh, screws. You could use a uh, allograft for that, where you attach uh, the allograft ligament or allograft tendon into the bone on the femur and on the tibia. Um, and again, it's rare for that, but it, if you do have it, it could be uh, you know four to five months out from surgery for that. Usually associated, the MCL is usually rare to have a grade three by itself, usually associated with an ACL or meniscal tear as well. Moving on to ACL tears, uh, most important ligament in the knee, uh, most important for twisting, pivoting activities and uh, having stability uh, you know instability occurs uh, due to the laxity from the ligament being torn uh, and the big issue is that you can do further damage to the joint to the joint surface to the meniscus or to the other ligaments in the knee i'll oftentimes have people ask me could i live without my acl and and the answer is yes but you have to avoid 
uh, certain activity. So a laborer, typically, if somebody's lifting and twisting, usually you want to get that fixed. Uh, here's a picture. This is a front view on the left and a side view showing the ligament attachment from the femur down to the tibia. Um, here's a schematic and then the MRI uh, showing a uh, meniscal tear, I mean, I'm sorry, an ACL tear right in the, uh, in the, on the side view of that MRI and then the, uh, a graft. Uh, the surgery is what we do. We, we obtain a graft from the patient typically uh, if they're young, if they're older, sometimes we can do an allograft uh, because the results are, are the same. Uh, and then we attach in the femur, or we attach it in the tibia. So graft choices, you can have hamstring tendons, patella tendons, or allograft as we discussed. Uh, the rehab is extensive. They have people definitely have to know that ahead of time. This is not a, a, a quick knee scope or a quick meniscal trim. Uh, first six weeks are typically sedentary type activity with crutches and a, and a brace, uh, bending, gentle bending. Usually after about two months, people are walking fairly comfortably without the brace, uh, without crutches, uh, getting full range of motion, hopefully by two months. So driving is fine and, uh, and you know, gentle light activity is fine. Uh, typically, that tendon takes about six months to heal with a, uh, and to get strong enough to sustain activity. So first three months are tendon healing into the bone and then strengthening after that for a good you know, three to four months after that to, to get really strong. Again, here's a nice uh, care pathway that uh, I created with Cindy and we went over at, at what time People are safe enough to do certain things as we outlined at week six, week 10, week 14, uh, and then you know six months uh, afterwards. Um, so again, this, this pathway is very helpful for us, for the patient, uh, and for the physical therapist as well. One of the most common things we see is tendonitis, uh, especially of the knee, and it's typically of the patella tendon or the quad tendon. And a lot of it is just from overdoing things, just doing things too much, too frequently. And what the actual pathology is, and again, I got this off the, my 321 GoMD website. I love this picture because it shows the pathology of tendonitis. Tendonitis, the definition are little micro tears of the tendon. And as you see here on the, on the slide, you see these little tiny tendons that are uh, uh, tendon fibers that are uh, Torn. So you have micro tears of the tendon, and those little blue cells in there are the cells that are coming to try to heal that tendon to make it look like the normal tendon on the right again. So you see normal tendon on the right, and the middle is that micro tears of the tendonitis. And it's, it's very helpful when patients can see what, what it actually looks like to them, you know, that they realize they're overdoing it, they're doing you know, too much, and that you do need some healing time to allow this to heal. So usually as a, as a detective, we want to find out, uh, you know, detective work as a doctor in the patient's uh, visit, you really want to get a good history when it comes to tendonitis. Usually they'll say there was no injury, uh, that they just felt pain the next day or pain that later that day. And if somebody says, oh, I was, you know, piling some wood, you want to sort of get, a, get an idea of, you know, how much wood, how long were you piling the wood or stocking the wood. Do, is this what you do every day of your life, or is it, was this a new, you know, a new uh, job that you were given? And so, you know, you, you want to kind of get a history. Uh, and it's usually again too much. Something's too awkward, too fast, too long. Doing doing something excessively. Um, so other things, not warming up is an issue. Body position, sudden uh, speed, you can get uh, injuries with that. Uh, you know, in, if you're not warmed up, uh, then the tendons can be a little more friable and brittle. Uh, and some, you know, workplaces are, are incorporating, you know, morning or pre pre uh, works uh, stretching and loosening up as a group. Uh, great team activity and a great way to get your tendons loosened up and, and mobile before you uh, stress them. So body position, you know, you see the guy at the top of this ladder and you're maybe a little worried about his, uh, you know, his positioning of his arms and uh, then you do a little more investigative work and you find it's the guy who's actually at the bottom who might have, uh, have had an issue with uh, the way he's holding that ladder for him. Uh, and it's something too heavy, you know, you gotta be careful when you're lifting and, and 
know, it's, can you overdo it with weights and with lifting? Yes, yeah, so you have to, you know, be moderate, uh, be gradual, and not not overdo it. Um, another common uh, thing that we see, you know, typically a fall onto an outstretched, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, if you fall and land on your knee, um, you know, most people uh, fall onto an outstretched hand, but as they do, they'll, their knee can take uh, impact. And when the knee takes the impact, you know, we're oftentimes worried about a real fracture, worried about ligament injuries or meniscal injury. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, here we see the architecture of the uh, of the knee, and you see it's uh, made up with this cancellous bone, and this cancellous bone is what gets injured during uh, during a contusion or a fall. Uh, and here's what an MRI of a contusion looks like. It's swelling or bleeding within the bone, and it's uh, those little tiny lattice work uh, that gets disrupted. So technically, it's disruption of those little, that cancellous area. And it shows up uh, on an MRI. It lights up like a Christmas tree, as you see there. And uh, typically, it's not a fracture. You don't see a fracture line. But it's, uh, it can be very painful. And it can mimic other things. As we said, it can mimic um, meniscal tears. It can mimic true fractures. Uh, but that swelling needs to go away uh, and it needs to heal. So um, again, it's, this is a simple diagnosis of just you know, taking it easy, getting uh, rest, getting off your feet, not pushing through pain and allowing the, the swelling and, and the healing to take place. And typically that's about, uh, I would say bone contusions, typically about three weeks or so from a bone contusion uh, before somebody's feeling you know, almost 100%. Bursitis, another very common uh, question, another very common issue that we have uh, with uh, office visits and people worrying about bursitis. You know, again, imagine that person landing on their knee and all of a sudden they get this swelling and they think it's, you know, a ligament issue. They think it's a, uh, an issue with the joint or a fracture. Uh, typically, someone will have full range of motion of that knee. They'll have uh, sudden swelling you know, in front of the kneecap, that's called the prepatellar area, and it's a prepatellar bursitis. And uh, what happens is the bursa, which is, people say it's a sac, but typically it's just tissue that, uh, you know, glides against each other. The bursa is just this nice, silky, smooth tissue. And uh, what happens is if you impact that tissue and you get bleeding into the lining of the bursa, which lines the bone, and so you can get uh, bleeding on top of the bone, from the tissue that covers the bone, that's what then develops into that bursitis, where there's fluid, there's, uh, people will sometimes feel pebbles or little uh, soft tissue structures in there, and they'll feel, you know, they'll worry that it's a chip fracture, but it's typically just soft tissue. Um, and I'll show you the soft tissue right there. That's, that's the soft tissue, which is in front of the kneecap that gets injured and it bleeds, and then it forms this fibrous structure. As you see there on the left, this fibrous, gritty tissue um, that uh, people will get. You see the MRI showing the amount of fluid in front of that patella where uh, you can put a needle in that and drain it if somebody doesn't like it. Usually it's, uh, you try not to put a needle in and just see if it goes away on its own. If it doesn't go away and it's annoying, um, you know, because it can get infected, uh, if you put a needle in it, it also can get infected by itself if you just have fluid that sits there and is a warm fluid that sits there that can be an infection too. So typically I'll say if it bothers somebody, if somebody, it's reasonable if somebody is kneeling on their on their knees all day and it's annoying to them, then it's certainly reasonable to try to aspirate it. Uh, sometimes right after aspiration, the fluid comes back and, uh, and people, um, you know, call up within, you know, I'd say, 24, 48 hours, they call back and say that the fluid uh, came back. Um, so that is, uh, you know, or, you know, the final step is excising it. You can actually go in there and excise the tissue, take it out. Um, and that is typically, a, you know, two week recovery. Uh, where you just excise that tissue, you wait for the skin to heal, and then uh, getting them back kneeling on their knees again would be uh, on the order of, you know, three to four weeks after surgery, typically. 
patella subluxation or dislocation. So this is a can be confused with an ACL uh, because it's a sudden onset of pain. People feel that their knee shifts on them and they get this dramatic swelling, huge amount of swelling. And you know this is one time where an orthopedic surgeon where they can just examine the knee and they can feel that the ligament, the ACL is intact. And then uh, that's this is sort of another um, another option uh, is another possibility uh, is um, the the kneecap uh, dislocating or subluxing, and you can see on the slides on the bottom what it looks like. Somebody will will uh, comment and say that the the patella, you know, they saw their patella, they, it freaked them out. They saw the patella on the side of the knee. They hit it and it smack. They put it back into the into the knee, or they go to the emergency room like that with this little patella, you know, sticking off to the side of the knee, and and uh, and and in the emergency room, basically the the maneuver is you uh, hyperextend their knee, and that relaxes the tendon, the quad tendon, the patella tendon, and then that allows then the uh, the kneecap to shift back into place. You can then also try to lift the kneecap up and put it back into place. Usually with this uh, situation, it's um, non-operative treatment, especially if it's a subluxation versus a dislocation. Uh, you know, subluxation is you can get just swelling, pain, and soreness, uh, whereas dislocation, you can get a complete tear of the tendon. There's a higher chance of it recurring, that this could recur, and recurring can happen just twisting, pivoting, you know, standing, and all of a sudden the kneecap dislocates. Some recent studies out there that support, um, just like shoulder uh, dislocations, first time shoulder dislocations, uh, shoulder dislocators, there's studies to support fixing those people before they be develop a loose, loose shoulder. Same thing with patella dislocations. Um, there's some literature to support fixing them after their first dislocation. Uh, older treatment was, you know, give it three times, but the studies are showing that giving it three times, you can develop arthritis because that kneecap um, shifts and the, the joint surface hits up against the femur and you can get uh, pieces of bone and loose bodies that, that break off. And so uh, some of the recent studies are suggesting fixing these uh, patella uh, before uh, things get, get worse. Let's see here. And this is what you do, the uh, medial patellofemoral ligament reconstruction, where you reattach that ligament. That ligament is what holds the kneecap in place. And if it's torn, then you, you develop this laxity or looseness where the, where the uh, patella can shift and, and dislocate. Um, so that's a simple, similar surgery to an ACL where you're reconstructing a ligament, you're using crutches, you're using a knee brace, you're uh, reattaching ligaments and trying to get things to heal. So, um, so it's important to, uh, you know, to uh, protect them. Six weeks, uh, typically crutches uh, for the first couple of weeks and then a knee brace for six weeks. And then again, four to five months for return to, to full activities and getting back to, back to life. Uh, and uh, Gigi has prompted me for our, our last poll question as we move into arthritis and patellofemoral syndrome. Um, so here is the third poll question. Of these treatments for knee arthritis, which ones have you heard recommended? And you may select multiple treatments. It is multiple choice. So ingesting deer antler velvet, injecting sugar water, massaging lavender, rubbing chili peppers, getting bee stings, or putting leeches on your knee. Anyone hear these, had these, or seen these? Um, you may submit your responses now. And by the way, all of these are treatments. Um, the question is, do they work as effective as other, other things? All right, folks, again, don't be afraid to vote. Um, as Dr. Rocket said, these are treatments. Um, even though you may not have heard of them all. So please select as many as you may have heard of so we can get an idea of um, what you have heard uh, during some of your claims management. All right, we're at about 33% who are voting. Let's see if we can get a little bit higher. Oh, 
Okay, we will shut down the voting in three, two, one. There we are, bee stings. Bee stings are uh, what people have heard about. And uh, as I was doing some of the research for this, I was looking up onto these other, uh, these other alternative uh, treatments. Uh, so what is the definition of arthritis? It is the loss of cushion of the articular cartilage where you have bone exposed. And this is a, a good shot here uh, from my 321 Go MD, where you see the definition of arthritis, where this can be post-traumatic, uh, where you land on your knee and you rip that articular cartilage off, or it can be degenerative, um, where you you just have arthritis in your knee, and all of a sudden you you know you've been standing on your knees all day, and, and you, you develop pain. Uh, or patellofemoral syndrome, similar. Uh, patellofemoral is more anterior knee pain. Somebody who's squatting uh, and can develop anterior knee pain if uh, you know with patellofemoral syndrome. Uh, and this is you know we do an X-ray sometimes if somebody is persistent in their complaints of uh, pain or swelling or soreness, just to make sure everything is okay. And that's a typical normal knee and that's a you know real severe knee. Uh, you get an x-ray like that on somebody and they have maybe their primary care ordered the MRI and the MRI uh, says that there's a meniscal tear and that person on the right has that x-ray. Uh, there's, there is, you know, very, very unlikely that that meniscal tear is causing symptoms right there. Uh, and this is what patellofemoral syndrome looks like. And it's really typically, you can have arthritic change or it can be just pain in the patella where you, you're having a stress reaction where the, the patella is rubbing up against the femur. And, uh, and this on the right is the arthroscopic picture of what arthritis, uh, early arthritis can look like under the kneecap. And this is an image, this vector image here, of if somebody is bending and they're squatting, the, the red arrow shows that the forces can go up with squatting where the kneecap can rub up against the femur and, and you develop anterior, anterior knee pain. The bottom pictures show a normal patella, beautiful articular cartilage, and the other uh, patella uh, shows some arthritic change in the, we call it the trochlea, which is the, where the femur is on the bottom and then the patella up top. So the trochlea and the patella articulate and that forms the patellofemoral joint right there. So treatment options, physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, cortisone, uh, gel or visco supplementation injections and then PRP injections. And there are some studies uh, suggesting that PRP um, has some good uh, anti-inflammatory properties. It doesn't regrow anything. Uh, but it, uh, the injections and the double-blinded studies going up against cortisone, that PRP did have, uh, have some effects and uh, beneficial effects for just from an anti-inflammatory point of view. And I have seen that with some of my patients. And then uh, going on to the patella quadriceps tendon tear. We've seen a bunch of these recently. Um, uh, patellas or quadriceps tendons attaching to the patella what can happen is the, the tendons rip, usually right next to the patella, and you get these uh, deformities where people cannot lift their leg up. And so these are really one condition, which is um, you know, an absolute indication for surgery. Uh, you know, there's a normal MRI there um, of what the patella, and the, or I'm sorry, there's a little partial tendon tear. I'm sorry, that's partial tear. Uh, we have the quadriceps tendon coming in and you see a little tiny tear at the top of the patella. Um, typically partial tears do not need surgery, um, but full tears, as you see here, where it's fully detached, uh, do because, you know, people can't lift their legs up. They can't function. So that is a, you know, five to six month recovery typically of getting back to full activities, um, you know, four or five months, uh, you know, early-ish and then five to six months, really strong. Uh, the tendons reattaching through the bone, uh, light duty things by two to three months, they're off brace typically by two to three months, uh, and then working on range of motion with physical therapy, lots of physical therapy for these. This loose bodies or defects we talked about with uh, if the patella subluxes and you, uh, and you get a dislocation, you can get a loose body, a piece of uh, tissue floating around like that. Typically, you want to uh, get that piece out of there. 
And then if you're left with a defect, as we see on the right, then you know that is a sometimes an issue for cartilage transplantation um, or the oats oats procedures where you drill a little plug and you plug that that defect uh, with a little bony bony plug. And then uh, lastly, uh, knee dislocations, um, all different types of knee dislocations. And <clears throat> basically the knee, if it goes one way or the other, you're gonna tear the ligament in the direction the knee goes. So if it's off to the inner side, you'll tear the MCL plus the ACL. If it's the outer side, you'll tear, you tear the lateral collateral. You can also tear the posterior cruciate and the, uh, and the uh, anterior cruciate. So multi-ligament knee injuries, very difficult um, recovery, long recovery. Uh, issues with it are that you can you can injure the popliteal artery. It's that significant. Um, and so that's the number one concern with the knee dislocation, making sure the vasculature is, is normal. But then uh, figuring out you know, the timing of the ligaments and which ligaments need to be reconstructed, which ligaments are, are uh, partially torn versus fully torn. And that takes, you know, MRI, orthopedic exam, and uh, a lot of patients with uh, knee dislocation injuries. But uh, the goal obviously is to get them back to a stable knee, a functioning knee, and uh, a knee that they can rely on uh, in the future. So with that, I'll wrap that up. And uh, after the tour of the knee, uh, take any questions that anybody has. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Rocket, for sharing such great information about knee injuries and treatments and recovery. So um, at this time, we'll shift into our question and answer session. Please be sure to submit your questions using the Q&A feature within the Zoom dashboard. And if by any chance you're having any um, IT issues, again, you can use the chat functionality and we'll be watching that. Uh, so the first question we have, we saw some references to care pathways, and um, we're going to ask, uh, do you feel that care pathways have helped patients set their functional status goals? Yeah, I and, and what was it, has it helped people with their functional? Status goals. Oh, status goals, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think knowing, knowing uh, ahead of time where you're supposed to be in relation to sort of most of the people that recover from this injury. Uh, people are competitive and they want to know, you know, are they, are they in the same, uh, are they, are they healing as they should be? Uh, people will always want to know, are they in the norm? And, and it gives them an idea of, you know, this is normal to be delayed, you know, at this time period, or is it, um, you know, are they healing quicker than normal? People love to hear that they're doing better than normal. And you know what is normal? Normal is just an average of people that we see with a similar condition, uh, and and sort of giving them the idea of when it's safe to return and when other people have returned to work. Uh, I think is helpful. Yes. Thank you. Um, next question: What type of procedures can you do in your office? Um, so in the office, uh, so. So we, we do have a surgery center, so it's right above our office, but uh, we, we, we don't, uh, 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 we bring people for surgery up to the uh, office, I mean, up to the surgery center. But uh, in the office, I would say it's, uh, it's mostly injections. We'll do PRP injections in our office, cortisone injections, aspirations with, uh, you know, aspirating bursa or Baker's cysts uh, in the office. Uh, uh, but typically it's uh, surgery goes up to our, you know, our surgery center. Nice, you've answered two questions in one. There was another question about where you do surgery. So it looks like it's in the same building, but upstairs, yes? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's a brand new facility. We're very happy with it. And, uh, and it's been, you know, people have been very happy with it. We, uh, we did our first uh, hip and knee replacements up there. And, uh, and uh, so you know, people are very happy with, uh, just getting in, getting out, not having to navigate uh, big facilities and uh, and getting really, really great attentive care. Great. Uh, here's another question, and it talks about, um, it's not the simple conditions that are the problems. Oftentimes, it's the conditions or injuries that may cause continued pain after procedures, resulting in extensive work 
such as a joint replacement. So do you do any procedures to help delay the need for a joint replacement? Yeah, we're all, well, I would say we're always trying to delay uh, the need for a joint replacement, um, especially in younger people. Uh, and, and typically that will, will involve, you know, managing pain and trying to deal with the, their pain. Uh, cause that's really the number one reason to have a joint replacement is pain. The other reason would be instability or buckling, uh, if the knee is not stable and they have, you know, significant arthritis, but, you know, somebody with pain with significant arthritis, it's, um, you know, typically, uh, injection therapy or you know physical you know number one physical therapy getting the knee strong getting the knee you know strong enough to be able to support them uh and i found that that help that is helpful that if if you can you know strengthen the muscles enough uh people's pain sometimes diminishes so even getting them on an exercise program getting them on a program where they can uh you know if they have uh weight is an issue that they can lose weight and that can help decrease the stress on their knee but um, you know, as far as delaying, it's it's yes, uh, cortisone, uh, long-acting cortisone, Zoretta, uh, Visco supplementation, um, and then PRP has been a helpful option too to uh, to try to decrease symptoms. Those are sort of the uh, the stall tactics, as 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 we like to say. But then, if somebody you know, if somebody needs it, if somebody has bad arthritis, if somebody um, you know is having trouble, then uh, and knee replacement is is a, is a great procedure for for people typically. Okay, thank can you. I, can, I um, here's, can I interrupt for a yes, second? Yes, please, Cindy. Um, have you ever? I don't know exactly what it's called. Have you ever heard about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, uh, I've I've read about it and saw it. Um, there's there's cold. I used it myself, but um, I've, I've I've read about it and. Uh, have you, do you think that they're effective at all? Like, do you, do you know anything about whether they're just, effective? Just from the uh, from the reports, it seems like it's. Um, you know, it's it's not you know 100 percent effective. I would say uh, just from some of the literature that I've read on it. Yeah. We're always looking for things because some Perfect. people have injuries so early. Right. Like, what can we do to delay the? We know it's inevitable, but you know, you don't want people to have a knee replacement at a young age. Right. Absolutely. No. And that's and that's tough. You know, when somebody wasn't having pain and they are now having pain. The question is, is that pain? You know worthy enough of a knee replacement. Oftentimes it's not. Oftentimes it's like, okay, you have pain, but you can function, you can still exercise, you can still work. Um, you know, but sometimes people just really latch on to that new pain that they have and they want to have a knee replacement. Whereas, you know, knee replacements initially were designed for people having trouble walking, you know, having trouble, you know, just climbing stairs. Um, you know, as opposed to, you know, they they, you know, can't run as far as they used to. You know, we're we're finding that people coming in, you know, wanting knee replacements who can't run as far. You know, so it's the people have been sort of pushing the envelope of of replacements. Yeah. How how often can you have a knee replacement? Well, hopefully it's one, <laughs> just or two, left and right. But um, you know, hopefully one. You know, the studies that have been out there are, are showing about a ninety percent survival rate after uh, after. Um, you know, 30 years. Wow. The, the younger people that, and this is a reason to delay, is the younger people actually uh, go through. Uh, there's a higher revision rate that they they wear through the prosthesis quicker. So that's one of the tricky parts of of replacing somebody knee who's very young is that uh, they can wear through it quicker. Thank you. Thanks. I have one more question that came in. Um, how can you tell the difference between a chronic meniscus tear and an acute tear? Um, good question. The it's very difficult um, on it. So you know, I'm assuming they mean on an M, you know number one would be symptoms, and then number two would be on MRI. Uh, MRI um, 
for a chronic tear is is again it's very difficult to to, dis, to decide that because you can have tissue planes that look uh, fresh i would say in a young knee without arthritis if they have a meniscal tear uh, that is a you know a straight vertical edge uh, or a straight horizontal edge or you know a bucket handle that you know if somebody doesn't have arthritis they're they're not likely to have a chronic tear um, but if they do have arthritis, that's when you get into, um, you know, that there can be degenerative uh, conditions. Uh, but usually it's symptoms going by their symptoms. If they, uh, you know, come in saying they had a previous meniscus tear that was seen on an MRI uh, and that they have a new tear, then they, maybe they, that tear became bigger or that tear flipped and then all of a sudden it became unstable. Um, you know, so a lot of it can be symptoms or what the, what the MRI actually looks like as far as the verticality of the tissue uh, and the amount of arthritis in the knee. All right, thank you. So uh, that is the last question I have in my queue. If you have another burning question, we'll give you a few seconds to submit your question. Um, in the meantime, Thank you for joining this second session of the Injury Insight Series. Again, Dr. Rocket, thank you so much. For those uh, in attendance, a playback of this webinar will be available within 48 to 72 hours. Additionally, we do ask that you take the time to complete the webinar survey. Uh, finally, certificates of course completion will be emailed to you within five business days along with a confirmation of your license number for reporting if you are a public insurance adjuster. Um, okay, I don't see any more questions. So again, thank you for your participation. Cindy, Cindy, any final words? No, just thank you, Dr. Rocket, for giving us your time. We really appreciate it. It's nice to see you in person, sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> yes, thank you. No, thank you All right. Much. Thank you. Okay. Absolutely. Next session is September 29th, managing an injured rotator cuff from therapy to surgery and everything in between. If you haven't registered for the entire series, you can do so by visiting us online at www.medicalandlifecare.com, or you can register specifically for this session, which is in September. Again, thank you everyone for your participation and have a great day.